Psy Access, May 10, 2024. Signs of Disability, a new vision for mathematics. Dr. Lisette E. Torres, Dr. Daniel L. Reinholtz. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I know uh, today has been a lot of interesting sessions, and I hope Daniel and I can add to the conversation and the add to what you all are learning today. Um, welcome to Signs of Disability, a new vision for mathematics. <clears throat> a basic overview, um, Daniel and I are going to talk about who we are a little bit in relation to disability. I'll go over a few key terms, but then we're going to jump right into disability within mathematics, um, then talk about shifting the culture of mathematics, particularly with our website, Signs of Disability, and then hopefully have time for some questions. So just a real quick exercise for a few seconds. Picture what it comes to mind when you think about a, a disabled person. I'll give you a few seconds. So I can imagine that a lot of you, the first image that came to mind was someone who was in a wheelchair. Um, but for many of us, um, especially Daniel and I, we identify as individuals with non-apparent disabilities. Um, and so here we have an image of a variety of different kinds of people from different cultural backgrounds and different impairments and uh, disability types. I will let Daniel introduce himself now. Daniel? Hi all, I'm Daniel Reinholtz. I use they, them pronouns. Um, there's a picture here in my own image description, I'm a white masculine presenting person with light brown hair um, and a number of piercings. And on the slide, I've put um, a number of different non-apparent disabilities um, and I think, you know, for me as a mathematician and someone working in that field, folks look at me, most people in the community don't see any of this. And, you know, I, I've been disabled my whole life. And with the COVID pandemic in particular, I think that was what pushed um, Lizette and I to start working together to really think about um, disrupting norms and thinking about disability and access in mathematics. I'll pass it back to you, Lizette. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, this is Lisette speaking. Um, here's a photo of myself. Um, I am a disabled Latina. Um, I identify as a mother, scholar, and activist, but I'm also a scientist. So I am a former aquatic ecologist, now social science researcher. Here is a photo of me with short brown hair, dark rimmed glasses, a black long sleeve shirt with yellow flowers and a necklace. And my non-apparent disability was acquired. I have fibromyalgia, but with that, I also have depression and anxiety. Um, I also identify as a daughter of a legally blind Latina and with sisters who are also disabled. So though I have I acquired my disability later in life, I have been learning about disability and what it means to be disabled my whole life. Um, so that's how I come to the work. So a few key terms. Um, we talked about, I know um, our keynote, Ashley Shu talked a little bit about ableism and disableism. Here we're saying that ableism is discrimination in favor of non-disabled people. So ableism is very much present within academic spaces, particularly mathematics. Um, disableism is discrimination against disabled people. So those are the, the differences there. But when we talk about able-bodiedness, we're talking about uh, the abled body as being viewed as the norm. And so According to Keywords for Disability Studies, ableism is the ideological hypervaluation of ableness and the ways in which sub such norms of abled and disabled identity are given force in law, social policy, and cultural values. And what's particularly important for us is the ways in which 
um, society constructs these ideas of normality, particularly in terms of intelligence within mathematics and excellence, uh, desirability, and productivity in academic spaces in particular. Um, a lot of folks uh, come from the social model of disability, which basically focuses on disability rights, um, encouraging people to focus on the individual as a person rather than uh, the impairment or disability types they come with. But I would say Daniel and I are very much more focused on disability justice, which is focused more on addressing, addressing the systemic issues of oppression and acting preemptively ra rather than reactionary. Disability rights often is focused on law and lawsuits, and we're, we focus more on community building and centering those who have been the most impacted, which are often those who are disabled and have another marginalized intersectional perspective. Just wanting to highlight that one in four adults have some type of disability and that differs um, with race and gender. But like Ashley Shu mentioned in her keynote, we are, will be seeing more disability in academic spaces, whether that's quote unquote better analytics in terms of diagnoses or the disabling events mentioned by Dr. Shu, the pandemic, natural disasters, war, detention centers, and trauma associated with, with those events, as well as changes in legal qualifications. So I'm thinking about now how the COVID long haulers are now part of the definition of disability. So the, this is all with the, the social context in which we come to mathematics. Daniel? Hi, Daniel here. So this, the background of this slide is just the results from a Google search, what you get when you look at disability and mathematics. So we wanna, now we're gonna narrow in specifically on disability in the context of math. And it turns out what you would find, you just get a lot of results that are math learning disabilities. Um, and so very much in the same way that there's people have stereotypical images of disabled people, there's also stereotypical images of mathematicians and then stereotypes around what it actually means to talk about disability in math. And that doesn't necessarily create space um, for a lot of members of the disability community, which is one of the things that we've been working on. Um, so let's, we can pop down, that to, yeah, keep going. Um, and so again, so just a quick little thought experiment for folks um, to think about, and, and if you can, you know, feel free to jot down your thoughts, but if you were to think about famous mathematicians, and I know this is sci access, so bear with us mathematicians, we love science too. Um, <laughs> But think about 10 famous disabled mathematicians or, or just disabled mathematicians in general. How many could you actually come up with um, off the top of your head without, without doing a search? <laughs> and yes, you can feel free to drop things in the chat if you'd like to. Someone said Einstein. Einstein yeah. Um, but typically, it, so you don't t tend to get a lot of answers to that question. Um, and I, I don't think it's the fact, I mean, there are barriers, right? There are barriers for, for disabled people in mathematics. Um, but it's also sort of the math is a very specific discipline in the way that we fo it focuses on this sort of perfection um, or absolute truth and these types of ideas that I think can sometimes be disjoint from the way that people see disability. Um, let's go ahead. And so here is, these are, this is, slide has um, a set of statistics from, this is from the National Science Foundation. And the main thing, I wanna say two things about this for folks. One, one of them being, 
only recently has the National Science Foundation started reporting disability um, as part of these kind of workforce numbers, which is a great step in the, the right direction. Um, and, you know, with a lot of, I mean, preface, there's a very long way to go. STEM, STEM kind of fails on every measure of equity that we can think of, um, <laughs> but there have been um, pushes over the years for inclusion um, of, of different groups, particularly around race and gender have been major pushes in STEM. There's still very little movement around disability. And just, uh, I, I wanna just specifically call out, um, right, in every group of people that we put on these charts, whether that's women or non-binary folks or folks of color, um, then within the communities, disabled people in particular, tend to be even more um, excluded from STEM when we think about issues of access. So the data are starting to be collected, which is good, but we have a very, very long way to go. Um, I can do the next slide. And a couple um, elements of that. And here was a, a somewhat recent article, not that recent, I guess, in the Chronicle of Higher Ed. Um, and just looking at, you know, people with disabilities are a small percentage of the STEM workforce. Um, and, you know, we can sort of zooming out to the faculty level, we see there's very few faculty um, that are disabled that tends to be narrowed in with STEM fields. And so it's just, again, that lack of representation, but it, it also as other folks have, have looked at in some of the earlier presentations, who are the instructors that actually know how to create an accessible space? Or who are the instructors who can serve as role models for their students? And, and so in what ways do we have this sort of feedback loop um, that tends to continue this cycle of marginalization or exclusion? So next slide. I think you can do these ones, Lizette, if you want to do these. Two. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So we thought a case study would be wonderful to highlight what we're talking about in terms of systemic issues around um, ableism within mathematics. So our friend Roy Payan and his colleague Portia Mason um, were our blind students who recently, well, recently, 2015, sued the Los Angeles Community College District or LACCD for not following ADA and Section 504 guidelines. Basically, what Roy found was that when he talked to, well, he experienced this himself, but when he talked to other blind students, many of whom were also Latino, so there's the intersection of Latinidad and disability, uh, but when he talked to these students, he found that he and these other students weren't giving, weren't being given accessible mathematics materials. Oftentimes, as Roy experienced, they were being shuffled up the ladder in the administration, but no one, even though they were receiving federal funding and um, money specifically tied to providing accommodations, uh, they were not receiving what they needed. So in 2019, their case was proved, they proved to the federal district court that textbooks, handouts, websites, databases, and computer applications, many of which were tied to their mathematics curricula, were not accessible. And this actually caused many of those students to not progress in their studies at the community college. Um, the LACCD did appeal to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals at one point and were trying to claim um, disparate impact, meaning that the discrimination that happened to Roy and the others was, was unintentional and that it should be dismissed. Um, however, they lost, thank goodness. Um, but because one judge sided with them, there was still a lot of... Um, tension and negotiation still happening. Now, mind you, LACCD continued to deny that uh, they were ableist and refused to just pay for the accommodations. And so 
Finally, in 2023, a jury found that the LACCD violated the ADA in 14 different ways, and in most cases, they did so deliberately. Um, They were, luckily, Roy and uh, Portia received over $240 in damages, but all of this could have been resolved way earlier had they just provided the accommodations that the students needed uh, to be successful in their mathematics courses. Daniel? I'm meeting myself. This is Daniel. Um, (laughs) And so I just dropped a link. I don't know if that goes to everyone. If it can be made to go to everyone, that would be awesome. There's a a handful of slides here that come from a paper that um, colleagues and I recently wrote called Mathematics is a Battle, but I've Learned to Survive, um, Becoming a Disabled Student in University Mathematics. This is open access, um, but this basically is looking at um, just intersections of disability and math and identity. And so we're going to skip that because we want to get to our vision. Um, (laughs) But I just want to drop that link for folks if you're interested to check it out later. Um, let's go all the way to shifting the culture. Let's skip all these. All these, um, okay. Shifting the okay. culture. <laughs> okay. So, because um, really this is what, you know, we've given you a lot of context and a lot of background, especially for folks who aren't in math or who might not have the familiarity with some of the issues around disability and access um, for sort of what we've been trying to do over the last three years. Mm-hmm. Um, and what we've been working on is this community. We can go to the next slide, Was that? that we've been calling signs of disability. Um, And our overall goal, we have a lot of goals, um, (laughs) but we're trying to bring together um, folks who identify as disabled and want to embrace that aspect of their identity as mathematicians, um, to have community support, to have visibility, to have these other things. In the chat, I've seen two, two mentions of disabled mathematicians. And I think in my count by recognizing the perils of trying to diagnose people in the past and just the problems with diagnosis being the legitimate label needed to have a particular identity. Um, maybe about 40 mathematicians throughout history that are kind of well known. And that's that's not a lot, right? And there's a lot more disabled people that are either in the math community or would like to be in the math community. And so our goal is to create a space where that's possible and also, you know, to create resources that others can use to make the space more accessible. Um, so this is a dream of Lizette and mine um, that we have together and we're working on it, but it is difficult. And it's also difficult to think around, um, you know, numbers of mathematicians and other folks that we know in the community who just, given the stigma, don't really want to be out about that. And that's okay. It's totally respectable. Um, but understanding there's just a lot of barriers for people feeling comfortable and being able to bring their whole identities into this space. I'll pass it back to you, Lizette, if you wanna add more about it. Sure, Sure. thank you, Daniel. Uh, This is Lisette speaking. Um, Essentially, Daniel and I came together during COVID uh, talking about disability justice in mathematics. um, And we, we just thought the easiest way to start is to start collecting these stories and uplifting them and sharing them. So that's essentially the primary thing our website does. But like Daniel said, um, our bigger goals, our dreams, is to start connecting disabled mathematicians and disabled math educators, um, start to share and develop resources, and start really doing way more community building and advocacy. Um, What Daniel and I have been noticing is that one, there is a need. Uh, We've been, a lot of folks have been reaching out to us, sharing their stories, which um, are beautiful and vulnerable, and we appreciate them so much. Um, but also, you know, asking us to either come to their department to speak on their behalf, just to be that external um, 
external pressure that is sometimes needed um, for departments to really think more deeply and critically about disability. Um, but there's also been um, curiousness and, and a need for um, finding others, other disabled mathematicians to connect with, to commiserate with, to dream with. Um, and um, to also be able to point their departments or point their students to resources on disability within mathematics and how to teach um, as a disabled mathematician, but also how do you teach other disabled mathematicians? And so with, with that, I know Daniel and I would love to hear from the audience and hear if you are a mathematician, we would love uh, for you to reach out to us and to share your story and for us to dream about what mathematics could look like if folks could come as their whole selves. And with that, I think we are ready for questions. Thank you both so much. At this point, we have about seven minutes for questions. Uh, so any attendees that would like to ask uh, Lucette and Daniel a question, please navigate to the Q&A function, which you can find by clicking the Q&A button at either the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on what device you're on. And Lisette and Daniel, if you don't mind sharing the links that you posted on the screen in the chat as well, that would be excellent. This is, Caitlin, I think I don't have access to do it. I can only write to the panelists and hosts, it says. Um, so you have to uh, select in the to function. You have to change it from hosts and panelists to everyone. I don't have an everyone option. Interesting. <laughs> okay. I will work on fixing that. And in okay. the I'm but if you can just drop the link to in the chat, that would be yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you mind sending them to the hosts and panelists, and then I'll go I ahead. Did, and yeah, I did send the paper. Perfect. Um, then, in the meantime, we have a question from Alberto saying, "Have there been any uh, support with in math professional societies for uh, disabled individuals?" I can take that one. This is Daniel. <laughs> um, I think, you know, this is something that I would like for us to work towards more and even in our own advocacy. Um, and one of the things you can see is like the American Mathematical Society, the AMS. Um, they have these different posters of like women in math or, you know, Lat Latine folks in math and just all these different like kind of posters that I think people can just get for free. So it would be really cool to put something around disability um, and like disability and intersectionality too would be really nice. So um, yeah, definitely. there's work that we would love to do and we're trying to build more folks in our community to help us do it. Um, this is Lisa speaking. Just to say that uh, Daniel and I do not get any money for anything that we do through this project. Um, so it's very much a passion of ours. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, it's something that we definitely want to build and to grow. Thank you both for um, your answer. At this time, um, you are now able to send messages to all attendees, as far as I am aware. So you should be able to share any links and resources you would okay. like there. Thank you. And then we have a question from, um, oh, it looks like Dan was actually writing a question. Um, if you wanted to share out loud as well, I believe we had a question that was just asking about other ways to get involved. Yeah, Daniel here. I just, I actually just typed my... <laughs> LinkedIn link on there. I don't know. It made the question disappear. Um, but so we've been building a mailing list. It's not very active, but we're trying to make it more active. Um, we're hoping to add some resources and other things to the website. Um, and I, I think a great way to connect with us would just be to 
um, get an email contact. So you have your email, send, an, send a note to us, and then we can um, easily connect folks to everything that we're trying to do. And it's, like Lizette said, it's very small and grassroots right now, so we don't have um, all the formal channels, but we like to talk with people and we like to meet together. So um, feel free to reach out. Yeah, and you all should share your information as well in the uh, SciAccess Community Connections um, spreadsheet. I will share that link in the chat in a moment. That is where we are encouraging attendees and panelists alike to share their information in order to connect with each other as a form of networking, even though we are working in a virtual medium. We have one more question from Sarah saying, do you think there are any aspects of mathematics that make accessibility considerations unique compared to science, engineering, and technology? <laughs> Daniel, <laughs> you, you had an automatic response, so you could go in. <laughs> well, you can take this on a time. Oh, I, I certainly think mathematics is, is presents its own challenges depending on what kind of um disability type you have um i know roy's biggest challenge going on talking to roy payan um his biggest challenge as a bl blind latino was uh just finding somebody to read the textbook to him because there are no braille copies um or at least there were none available to him um and so his way of learning mathematics was very much oratory um which as you can imagine can be really, really challenging. Um, plus there's also the financial component that folks um, don't think about when it comes to disability. So Roy, when he was taking his mathematics courses, he was on social security and that was the only source of income that he had. And so when he was running up against these barriers, these academic barriers and being told to find a tutor, that tutor, he paid out of pocket. Um, and he was he he likes to say that he was blessed because he had the money to do so, because many of his colleagues did not. And so they they're retaking the same mathematics courses in, in an uphill battle to get a degree um, that's very inaccessible. Uh, Daniel? I'll add very quickly. I yeah, as Lizette said, um, definitely depends on the nature of disabilities that one has or the access needs. I think I work with a deaf uh, doctoral student, one of my doctoral students. Um, and so seeing, you know, the quantitative coursework, just to interpret equations from a hierarchical linear model or some of these different things is very, very, a lot of, there are a lot of barriers around that. Um, and we could think, I mean, I think other th in, in the paper that I linked to, that was with dyslexic students and looking at a very specific um, type of mathematical language and the way people write proofs and the ways that that could be confusing, um, I think is generally inaccessible for everybody. Um, right. <laughs> <but> <laughs> I would even more so. <laughs> um, but I, I actually want to focus on the flip side and think, um, you know, looking at the examples of famous mathematicians, I think one of the things that helps people succeed in mathematics is thinking differently um, and being able to look at problems through different lenses. And so I, I believe that actually gives uh, disabled people unique affordances to see the mathematics or, or hear the mathematics or do the mathematics in different ways um, than non-disabled or neurotypical folks. And so I think they're actually by reducing those barriers, there's not only opportunities for individuals in the community, but also just for math to be better in general. Um, and so I don't want to only focus on the challenges. I agree. Thank you, Daniel. Sci Access. Learn more at www.sciaccess.org.